So I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speaker, Jeff Varga. He's an ecologist and an entomologist by training, and he's spent his career running research programs on agri-environmental problems in the UK and in developing countries, working in the University of London and for the Commonwealth. He served on the scientific advisory committees of DEFRA and Natural England with a particular focus on invasive species. He's now partly retired, and he's, but he's using his time well. He volunteers through the Heath and Hampstead Society and Heath Hands on biodiversity conservation challenges on Hampstead Heath, with particular interest in the impact of human and dog activity on the wildlife there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to hand you over to Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Maria. And good, good evening, everyone. Let me share my screen. Um, get this up here um, and enlarge it. Um, there we go. I think that's got every. Is that working? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thanks very Perfect. much. Great. Okay. So. Um, uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting us to give this talk. I'm um, giving a talk tonight on behalf of a, a team of bird enthusiasts who conducted in 2020 a nesting bird survey on Hampstead Heath. Um, here we all are in the first slide, uh, myself, um, Adrian Brooker, uh, Liz Andrew, Pete Mantle, and Kennedy Crookshank. Now, we all belong to one or more of the organizations below. We're a bit of a, bit of a nest of, of, of volunteers. Heath and Hamp Society, City of London, and Heath Hands. Um, and so those are the, sort of the groups that have come together to do this. And um, I'm going to present our talk. Um, and then during the question time, maybe some of my colleagues will have some, some uh, additional points to raise about, about our survey. So let me first give um, an outline of the talk. Um, I'll start by introducing Hampstead Heath and why we felt the need to do a nesting bird survey there. I'll describe how we developed the survey methods and then share our results. And I'll focus on how we use these results then to identify birds that might be at risk and what might be done to protect them. Um, we're really keen to be giving this talk to the LNHS um, because um, we would really value your experience and advice. Uh, many of you are fellow bird watchers. Um, on how we design the survey, um, how we interpret the results, because basically this is the first and what we hope will be an annual survey, and we're keen to find ways to improve it. Now, I'll just say that um, I'll use a few photos to brighten up this talk, and wanted to say that they are all taken by our team, and most are taken actually during the survey. So you'll see what some of the things that we saw. Now, most of you know Hampstead Heath in one way or the other, it's about 320 hectares of habitats that were once English countryside, and they retain many of the ecological features um, and species that you'd associate with a bit of English countryside, despite the fact that it's now sitting in the middle of a metropolis. Historically, a lot of the heath was managed um, farmland and heathland, but over the past century, it has become more intensely wooded, and it has a small longstanding ancient woodland um, Ken Wood, which is a site of special scientific interest. The woodland, the meadows, the ponds of the heath are all managed for both recreation and for conservation by the City of London and by uh, English Heritage for the Kenwood Estate. And the heath has a long history of um, birding and bird recording. In the latter half of the 20th century, annual ornithological records were made, championed by Kate Springett, the founding president of the Marlebone Bird Watching Society. And these continued under different leads until the early part of this century when they stopped. And since then, records have been kept by different people in different ways. The Society's um, Hampstead Heath Survey section here in the LNHS has as one of its objectives to get bird records on the heath better assembled and organized in future. But almost mo all of the records so far have been on sightings of birds and not on bird nesting per se. And um, there have been only a few studies that have actually looked at bird nesting and then in sort of limited areas or limited times. And the idea for a nesting bird survey came to us through our concern about the impact of a number of recent developments on biodiversity in Hampstead Heath. These include the rapid recent increase in use of the heath by humans and dogs, um, and particularly as a result of, of the pandemic, um, and the potential expansion of commercial activities on the heath, like commercial dog walking, 
forest schools, forest bathing, whatever that is, um, and other nature experiences. And um, worthy and healthy as all these, these activities in nature are, they mean larger and larger numbers of children and adults spending longer and longer periods in a larger number of heath habitats. So that's something to think about when you think about biodiversity conservation. I mean, just as an aside, we think there probably were 15 million visitors to Hampstead Heath in 2020. That is more visitors than you get to a major British national park like the Peace District or the New Forest. Um, so it's a tremendous amount of forum to establish the status of biodiversity on Heath and to identify important sites where it could be protected and to monitor change as all of these changes occur. Uh, we chose birds because they're good biodiversity indicators, because we're bird watchers, and they're also easily appreciated by regular Heath users. We chose nesting birds because this gave a measure of the capacity of the Heath to support species that depended also on a healthy plant and animal food sources and habitats over the whole heat. So it's a measure of sort of the sustainability of the system to measure how, how many birds are, do, are there and what they're doing. So the objectives of our survey were to first understand the breeding status of different birds and to identify species that might be at risk of loss from the heat. Um, and the secondly, to establish a survey protocol that we can use to monitor longer term trends in bird populations. Now, while many bird watchers on the heath will tell you about this species or that species nesting there, the actual longer term records are few. We're very fortunate that uh, Mark Hardwick, when he prepared the 1992 ornithological report, also made a retrospective study uh, to assemble information on what birds are thought to have nested on the heath since 1946 and even before then. And I'll return to that study because it'll make for a good comparison. So, Designing our survey, we began with the idea of using the British Trust for Ornithology's bird survey. It's a famous one, it's done across the UK. However, we found it difficult to adopt its specific procedures. The BTO survey is actually aimed at, at, at generating fairly general and simple estimates of the density of breeding birds from randy, randomly selected square kilometers uh, blocks in different parts of the country. And in each square block, it has two linear transects, which are run twice in the spring. And then on the basis of that, um, bird densities are calculated. But the blocks are randomly assigned. We asked, could you drop a block on Hampstead Heath? And they said, no, it's got to be randomly assigned. We discovered that there was never a, a, a block dropped near Hampstead Heath, so we don't have any data on that. But rather more importantly, we felt we needed a more complex survey that looked at different um, birds as they were distributed over the geography and the habitats of the heat. Um, and so we designed our own uh, survey with more comprehensive and bendy and twisty transects. Um, but we adopted basically most of the methods of the BTO. That means we walked the transects at fixed intervals soon after sunrise throughout the breeding season and recorded birds exhibiting what we call nesting related behaviors within a certain distance of each transect, in our case, 25 meters. Now, what is a nesting related behavior? Oops. Um, this is, uh, these pictures illustrate those. Um, one would be singing to declare a territory. Another might be carrying um, food, nesting, food material, nesting material, fecal sacs from a nest. Another would be making a nest, as this woodpecker is doing, or sitting on a nest like this missile thrush, or having a territorial dispute, or indeed the sighting of a fledgling. Um, bird species vary greatly in the kind of nesting behaviors they exhibit, um, and that does influence our results and create us some challenges, and I'll address those in a minute. So let me show you what a transect looked like. This is a bit of the heat, and this is a transect, um, one of our transects. We, we, we map them out. We pick roots that, in our experience, had habitats that may be important for a range of nesting birds. They grew rather organically, and in the end, we had eight transects. They ended up being a bit messy. Um, they went all over the heath, except the part that's called the heath extension. Now, each transect was about one to three kilometers. The total length of all the transects was about 17 kilometers. And we walked the transects using a map like this. 
um, on which we recorded for each um, nesting related behavior, the species, the kind of behavior and the bird's location. And we, we, we did the bird's location by actually writing it as a dot on the map. Um, and these maps could be done by anyone because we had photographic bits, as you see a bit at the bottom, you know, turn left here, turn right there. Um, and then with these maps, with all these bird locations of this bird singing or this bird making a nest, um, they were painstakingly digitized by Adrian Brooker at the City of London, um, generating a big Excel spreadsheet with all the records. And from this, we could then generate not only summary data about birds, sightings and behaviors, but also maps of where the birds were seen uh, showing nesting behavior. So the transects were walked six times at two week intervals from April to the end of June. So a total eight of 48 transect runs, eight transects times six each. Um, and that's what we did. We actually did a bit more. I'm gonna show you the data from from those because that's when we have the same number of walks on each transect so we can compare transects. So this is uh, the big picture, <laughs> okay? This is a map of Hampstead Heath. I hope you can see the underlying heath there. The green and purple and colored lines are all the different transects. And uh, so there are eight of those. And along each transect, you'll see dots. And those dots are, um, are sightings of birds. And this is the accumulated data from basically the, the, the whole season. And beside each dot is the BTO code for that bird. So WR is Wren and Wren is a red dot. And, um, and so this is the sort of a, an image of the total database. You see, we're basically recording birds around the edges of, of, of a transect all over the heath. Okay, so um, in all, we recorded over those six surveys, we recorded about 3,000 records of nesting behavior, but over those six surveys, we recorded 2,169 nesting related behaviors from 41 bird species. So let's extract some results from this data. First, we, we recorded 41 species, but of course there may have been more that we didn't see. And we did not spend much time on water birds because there's already an annual monitoring scheme for these. But how does this compare with the past? Um, so we looked at Mark Hardwick's summary in 1992, and this graph shows what he found um, uh, look at the middle graph first. This is the number of birds he estimated were nesting between 1946 and when he made his, his summary, um, 71 species, suggesting that over the past 70 odd years, we've lost from the heath about 40% of the bird species that were nesting there in the latter half of the 19th century. Hardwick recorded an additional 17 species that he believes were nesting before 1946, which is the left-hand column here. Um, there may have been many more. Um, that goes back in time. But if that is closer to the original avifauna of the heath, we could say we probably lost a bit over half of the original avifauna of the heath, or, or possibly a lot more. And this is perhaps not surprising, uh, given what we know about bird decline in Britain, which has been dramatic, the likely impact of a changing heath landscape and the surrounding urbanization over the 20th century. Um, I I thought I'd show you just quickly some of the birds that Hardwick concluded were nesting at the end of the last century, because it's sort of interesting. Okay, so we have pheasant, skylark, cuckoo, barn owl, woodlark, rook, stone jack. I've just picked a few of the, what was it, 30 that, that aren't there now. Um, but you can see that um, some are ground nesting birds. Ground nesting birds are very quickly lost from any habitats with lots of dogs in them. Obviously, and there's, you know, maybe 10 million dogs get walked on the heath every year, maybe five to 10, I'd say. Um, and they're birds like cuckoos and woodlark with complex ecological requirements. But clearly the point of our survey is we would not like this loss to continue. We'd like to find ways to retain or even restore um, some of the bird diversity. So next, let's look at how you can build maps from the data set. And this is a, a bit that, that Adrian Brooker has been focusing on. So I'm sort of uh, relating some of his work. All the maps we produced um, were using the ArcGIS mapping program or an extension of it, which the city of London used called City Maps. Um, Adrian worked with Holly Smith in the city of London's uh, GIS team uh, to do this. 
And one of the ideas uh, that that team is experimenting on is using the maps to define um, how many birds of what species are actually breeding. And that means what, uh, what size uh, territory a bird might have, and then using that to try to decide how many birds were there. Um, so take a song thrush, this first example. A song thrush may have a territory of 0.2 to 6 hectares or larger, depending upon the habitat. Here we have all of our records of song thrushes singing. And for this, we've linked records of birds which were within a 50 meter radius that appeared over at least three different successive transect weeks. So this is a bird, a bird, a song thrush singing in the same place nearby for three transects. Um, and this allows us to, to maybe take a guess at which birds were maintaining in a presence in an area over a longer period. And they may therefore have a nest territory there. And the map shows a potential 20 song thrush territories within this record area. And clearly the system has some flaws in it. It's a first attempt, but it may allow for some kind of year on year uh, estimate of territory numbers within the recording area. But of course it doesn't give a total number of breeding territories over the heath because these are just transects. But you know, there might be ways to sort of multiply by the bits that we didn't do and, and project that. Um, that was relatively easy. This is a, a map of stock dove on the heath, um, and it shows some of the issues where a greater number of records are closer together with overlaps. Um, it makes defining a territory much more different. That big cluster is Kenwood, full of many ancient trees, full of holes, full of stock dove nests. And so how many stock dove did you actually have there? If you know stock dove, they love just getting up in the top of a tree and cooing, and so you don't quite know what tree they're going to go down and nest in. Um, and then finally, um, just to show you this, this is a heat map that was produced by accumulating records of all species records across the site. So it's a bit like the one I showed you with all the colored dots, only this is, measures the intensity of those, of those records. The redder the color, the more records from near that spot. And it, um, so it, it, it does highlight a flaw in our current transect system, which you might be able to detect, which is, um, the red areas we actually believe to be really good areas for birds, but they also happen to be areas where transects come very close to each other. <laughs> so there is a slight risk that, you know, when we ran one transect, we're counting the same birds that we ran in that part of, the, of another transect. So that's, that's something for the future. The double counting could be the case. Um, next is to look at um, which of our species may be at risk. Uh, before I do that, I have to issue a caveat about comparing nesting related behaviors between species. You can't just do that easily because some birds differ in the kinds of nesting related behaviors that we can easily record. So birds with territorial singing may be recorded more than birds that do not have songs. You can record black caps singing more than you're gonna record woodpeckers and singing. They don't actually sing, they drum, so. Um, uh, birds nesting in easily seen tree holes may be recorded more than birds nesting in bushes. So we should not overinterpret comparison between species about commonness and rarity. And when we do want to make a comparison, it's probably best to look for substantial differences between birds which show the same kind of nesting related behaviors that are, you know, that sing for territories or something. So just mention that in pasting. So how might we determine which bird species are more at risk? I've got to present you an argument here. Um, and the argument starts, first think, how might bird species be lost from the heath? And there are a number of possibilities, uh, destruction of habitat, regular disturbance by people and dogs, loss of particular food resources, um, and there may be others. We happen to have quite recent scientific evidence that some of these things are happening on the heath with respect to, to things like disturbance of people and their effects on birds. So, um, but given that, then what causes a species to be vulnerable to these effects? And the argument that, that sort of developed, that if a species is already rare or found in only a few places, then it's probably more at risk. If it's rare, it's because of an event like a cold winter or uh, too many people in a summer during a pandemic could just push it out, push out the last breeding pair. If it's very patchy, it's very vulnerable to something happening on particular that site. And if it's rare and patchy, it's even more so. So what we thought we'd do is for each species, we consider two things, the abundance of the bird on the heath and its patchiness. 
how it's distributed. So we, we developed a measure for this. The abundance was simply the number of the species recorded per 100 meters of transect on the heath. For patchiness, we broke the heath into five parts and we calculated the coefficient of variance, which is simply a, a, a statistical measure of if you've got something distributed over a number of parts, how evenly is it distributed? Um, so with a coefficient of variance, a very low number means that you've basically got an even distribution across all the, all the parts and a higher one, which in our case maximizes around two, um, you've got something that's very, very isolated. So maybe only in one of the five parts of the heat, right? Um, so here's some records just to give you a feel for what these things look like. The absolute most common bird on the heath is the wren in terms of, of territorial, or sorry, of uh, nesting related behavior. You know, a lot per, per 100 meters over the season, very low coefficient of variance. There wasn't anywhere you wouldn't find a wren. Um, jackdaws are interesting. Um, they're quite localized. They breed in a large number in, in Kenwood, in the ancient trees, and almost nowhere else. So they show reasonable numbers, um, but they show very high coefficient of variance. They're extremely patchy. If somebody cut down Kenwood, you wouldn't have any jackdaws. Um, and then we get into the birds that we're more concerned about. Take the missile thrush. So not very many missile thrushes, actually reasonably distributed over the heat. But if you go to something like a greenfinch, or a white throat, or a sparrowhawk, even lower numbers, lower um, abundance, and really quite high um, patchiness. Um, and indeed, sparrowhawk, white throat. We think there there were three breeding white throats in the heath. Maybe maybe one or two more. Sparrowhawk, there were two. One nest failed. So we're talking there about birds which are uh, which are sort of patchy. And then what we did with this. Um, is that we, um, we applied to this um, a traffic light system, similar to the one that is used um, by the, the BTO and, and so on, as to whether a bird, the heat that we don't regard at risk at all, and we give that a green status where it's abundant and widespread of moderate concern, we give that an amber status or risk of being lost, which we give red status. And this traffic light is used nationally, and we took into consideration the national status of birds as well. So if a bird is declining nationally, it's quite common on the heath, we actually still gave it a fairly high risk rating because the heath is an important um, reservoir for that species. Okay, and so this assigns um, some of that status uh, to these birds, just to give you a for instance of what we did. And in brackets, you see the national rating for these birds. So wrens and jackdaws, we thought, okay, they're not at risk on the heath. I mean, jackdaws more than wrens, but in terms of the overall 41 species, we rated them both green. Um, missile thrush, um, although it's fairly widespread, it's quite rare, and it's also nationally red. So we've made it red. Um, green finch, uh, white throat, and sparrowhawk are, are not at risk nationally. Um, but, um, but in our place, uh, they certainly were. So we gave them amber and red ratings. And we basically created a, a, um, a, uh, a, a distribution of status across our 41 bird species. And when we did that, we found that about 40% of the heath breeding birds would be red and amber according to our, our calculations or classifications. So that, that sort of gives us some, um, gives us a bit of an idea of, of what, we, what we feel we need to protect. If we want to know though, uh, how to conserve these birds, we need to know where they're breeding and how that relates to the future use of the heath. And that involves coming back to maps. So coming back, this is um, that heat map again. It's a slightly different version. And uh, what I wanted to point out here, uh, besides the problem that, you know, when, when paths collide, we get more birds, duh. Um, but we do find areas of transect where there are there is relatively little bird activity. So I'll point you to um, I have my cursor. I think you can see my cursor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so this little patch here, um, there's not a lot of birds on this part. This is called Sandy Heath, and it's really one of these high um, beach oak woodlands with almost nothing in the ground, um, partly because it's sandy and partly because it's it's trodden on tremendously. Um, and so that's an area which is fairly low and some of the areas around the north bit of Kenwood. And the point about this is that um, 
a low activity area might be one where we might suggest some of these development activities go that could disturb birds, like forest schools, where you're going to have 30, 40 kids in a woodland all day, uh, once or twice a week, or even every day if it's a nursery one. Um, so, you know, if they say, where should we put forest schools? They put them where there aren't birds that are of importance nesting. So that was really one of the main points in that. But then we can also look at, at issues with existing species. So I'd like to show you a series of, of graphs that Adrian put together. because I think these are, these are particularly fun. These are the thrushes of the heath. We have um, B is blackbird, M is missile thrush, and ST is song thrush. And this is the distribution of, of records of those birds, in this case, singing. These are birds that basically showed nesting behavior in the same way by singing in territories, so they're pretty comparable, we hope. Blackbirds are the most abundant. That's not surprising. Song thrushes are a little bit more patchy, but you know, when you begin to look at this in detail, you say, well, it's interesting. There are parts of the heat that are quite, quite good for song thrush. Song thrush is a bird which is nationally declining. Um, and uh, and people are very worried about it. And I think Hampstead Heath has a disproportionate number of song thrushes for an urban urban um, green space, and quite uh, significant over here in the West Heath, um, and uh, and other patches where. And again, if we do it what Adrian did before, we can cluster these into perhaps a number of territories because these are accumulated um, uh, recordings. So they could mean that there's one bird that we recorded three times over three different transects, uh, runs of the transect. So, and then, but then I'd like to draw your attention particularly to missile thrush. So missile thrush is really quite uncommon as a nesting bird on the heath. You can see the blue dots are really quite scattered. So it's a bird that of some concern um, to us. It's one that we listed red. And we get song thrush, I think it was, was amber, maybe red because it's nationally declining like the missile. But one of the interesting problems here is one of the places we found missile thrush was this area I just pointed out to you. It's a place where, well, there's not a lot of birds. Maybe we can, maybe we can put a forest school there. If there, or maybe if somebody wants to put a forest school, they can put it there. So there are interesting issues around, you know, birds requiring different habitats. It might be that a rare bird requires a habitat that other birds don't need. But the basic point is this kind of stuff gives us more information than we had about how to protect different parts of the heath for different kinds of birds. Now, this is the next slide, and these are our warblers. So, going from the top on the legend, black cap, chiff chaff, lesser white throat, um, reed warbler, and white throat. So, black caps are abundant on the heath, and they, indeed they overwinter there, so we've got their singing now. Chiff chaffs, rather less so, and there are parts of the heath where chiff chaffs, you don't find that many, but in the middle of the heath, they're really quite common. So, chiff chaffs, and, and black caps seem to be holding their own quite well in Hampstead Heath. Now, um, I'm going to jump to white throats, which are the red dots. There's some here, there's some here, and there's some here. Um, at most, we think three nests, four nests. Um, they're all in particularly scrubby areas on the edge of meadows. And the issue there is that um, is that these are field margins where there's an intense activity from people and dogs and picnickers. So white throats really live in one of the most potentially disturbed parts of the heath with respect to, to human and, and dog traffic. So that's something we should think about. Lesser white throat turned up in one spot down here, actually on near Parliament Hill fields. Um, interestingly, it probably didn't breed there. I think maybe some of my colleagues can comment on that later. But it's interesting to note it has been seen there in previous years singing. So it's a potential site. And if it doesn't breed, it might just um, be encouraged to breed in principle. But that is a particular part of woodland along a path that has been trashed by overuse during the pandemic. So it, it points to some, maybe some ideas about if you want that bird around, you might need to think about some management of that part of the habitat. And, and then reed warblers um, are found um, sparingly around um, ponds and, and they may have bred here, sorry, the blue up here, they may have bred here on one of our ponds. And then finally, just very quickly, just one other map, just because it's sort of fun. These are finches. So chaffinch, purple, um, 
goldfinch green and greenfinch red. I should have, could have done that better. Um, and one just thing, an interesting observation, these are the kinds of things that come when you begin to do this, is it's interesting, a lot of the finches are rather located in the periphery of the main heath. And it sort of raises the question in, in our minds, for instance, that maybe the presence of some of these species like finches has something to do with the urban habitats surrounding the heath. And that maybe they provide, those habitats might provide food sources or even nesting sites that are, allow the birds to be on and off the heath. And I think you know the, the burst of goldfinch nesting within urban London is, is, is uh, very striking in recent years. And sort of wonder whether, you know, what the relationship of some birds is with the heath. Are they just heath birds or are they heath and urban birds? And that these kinds of studies help us figure that out. So let me just close with a slide which indicates some of the things we, we, we think we might do with this, uh, this information. And we'd love some more suggestions. Um, first, um, I, I just say that, you know, we're really thinking about not losing more birds, but this is equally applicable to maybe getting some birds back. Um, so, like I mentioned with, with uh, reed warblers um, and with, um, with lesser white throats, those are birds that sort of have a bit disappeared from the heath, and maybe we can create an opportunity not just to preserve the ones that are there, but to get more back. Um, so we can uh, use our maps, the first item, we can use our maps to identify habitats with few birds at risk, where developments like forest schools, which are maybe inevitable, um, uh, have the least impact. Secondly, we, we can work at a species level, identifying species at risk, um, the precise threats that affect each of these species and relevant interventions to address these. So these could involve, for instance, raising public awareness and changing behavior. Uh, we have an article coming out next week in the Hammond High on the green woodpecker and saying, please don't go around kicking over anthills because that's very important for green woodpeckers. So the kinds of species specific interventions. Also the, the, the Heath uh, Enhances Society is putting out biodiversity display boards on the heath this spring, which will highlight endangered species of birds and encourage people to identify and, and help protect them by, you know, keeping out of bushes, keeping your dogs on leads where they're supposed to be on leads and so on. Um, uh, we can uh, protect habitats by fencing. The heat doesn't like that, but it's possible in some cases temporarily. We can build habitats like building reed beds for reed warblers, which the City of London is doing. We could provide other resources like nest box or food if we know what species and what part of the need, heath need help. We could explore some off heat action to improve biodiversity, maybe around that whole finch idea. And of course, finally, we could continue monitoring to measure the trends, not, over, not only over time as numbers of people and climate changes, but also as people implement things like, like um, forest schools and so on. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I've got a bunch of colleagues all in the audience who are co-authors. So there, I think maybe during the discussion, they may want to add a few points, but I'd like to thank you and look forward to any any thoughts you've got? Thank you very much, Jeff. That was really a very clear explanation, I think, of the methodology and some really thoughtful analysis about the findings. Uh, I found that so fascinating. Um, I thought it really highlighted the value of mapping and, you know, the kind of information that could come through by seeing the sort of spatial layout. Uh, I was particularly interested in the idea about trying to work out territories, and obviously that's not a particularly easy thing to do, but it's got real potential, I think. Um, considering abundance and patchiness and as those as two measures of, to kind of work out which birds were particularly at risk. I thought that was a helpful idea. And I think there's also been a lot of thinking about the implications for habitat management and ways in which the nesting bird survey could actually kind of you know, work in a positive way to help protect um, bird, diver bird diversity on the heath. There have been a lot of questions coming through on the chat. So um, I think we'll go pretty much straight away. And yes, it would be great if um, the various people involved um, want, would like to chip in as well. And what we'll do is make sure, I think it looks like already people have been unmuted, um, but if they can maybe go through and unmute those people so that they can uh, get involved in the discussion, that would be great. Um, uh, we... people, yeah, people, people can now unmute themselves if they need to. Okay, oh, that, that's fine. Okay, da uh, David, should we go to a couple of the questions um, in the chat, if that's okay? 
Well, yeah, we'll have people coming if they want. There was one from uh, Caroline. I don't know if Caroline wants to come in and ask it about vegetation. If not, I'll just read it out. Uh, why don't you read it? Okay, I'll read it out. Um, so Caroline, there's been a bit of discussion in the chat, but Caroline asked, did, did, did you also do a survey of the vegetation? And if so, did it correlate with the bird species? For instance, woodpeckers near large trees um, and so on. Great. So that's one I'd love to pass to Adrian Brooker, who does the vegetation maps for the Heath. If Adrian is there, I, I can't see the whole list. Yes, I'm now on, hopefully speaking. Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, so we've got a vegetation survey of the Heath. Um, the issue with that is it's quite um, broad and generic. So you've got pockets of woodland. Within that, you'll have specific habitats. So actually, when you're 25 metres away, you don't necessarily, you're not able necessarily to record actually, was it in that tree? Was it in a scrub? Was it in a bush? Was it in a field? So actually, there's, there's flaws using the generic vegetation data. We're hoping next year to actually do some more specific stuff. So whereby we record if we can see the bird, the exact position it's in. So it's it's a tree singing bird, it's a scrub singing bird, it's in a tree in the grassland. We haven't quite worked on the protocol of that, but yes, vegetation survey is someone we linked in. We've got all the maps as well. So we've got the vegetation survey linked in the map so I can tell which bird is in which habitat. But because the habitats are so broad, it's not necessarily that simple. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, if people, just to say, if people want to ask questions in per person, if you just pop up your blue hand, um, we'll pick you up from the participants list. So you're most welcome to do that. Um, I can't see anybody at the moment. So, David, if we go on to the next question from the chat, please. Yeah, th there was a bit of discussion. Um, I, Bianca prompted it, but a few people coming about um, whether you recorded the, the parakeets and what you could say about their abundance and distribution. Yeah, I'd be quite happy to give a quick answer to that. I see Liz has made a comment. Liz and I and, and, and a colleague, Anne, um, we've been doing a study of, of tree hole nesting birds in Ken Wood, where most of the parakeet, well, not where a lot of the parakeets nest, all the jackdaws, a lot of stock up. And we were particularly interested to see whether parakeets compete with other birds. And the evidence we have is that they don't in that context. They use holes, hole sizes, which are considerably smaller. We've never seen a contest between them. We see jackdaws and stockdaws fighting all the time for tree holes, but never with parakeets. Um, and uh, parakeets may displace nuthatches. There's evidence from that continent. We didn't see that, but you know it requires more study. Um, but this, so that's a that's sort of a, a, a quick answer to that one. There are actually fewer parakeets nesting than you hear. <laughs> oh my God. You think they're hundreds, and they're actually you know we found maybe. 10 or 12 nests, they're obviously we missed some, but you know, in, on, on, in Kenwood, but it sounds like <laughs> They certainly, they certainly do um, make it, you know, each one makes a considerable amount of noise, doesn't it? They do, they do sort of give it a false impression, I think, sometimes. I'm gonna go to Kennedy next, because I know he's one of the people who's worked on the nesting bird survey and he's got his hand up. So do you wanna do you, uh, unmute yourself and um, share what you'd like to say to us, Kennedy? Yes, well, Jeff, thanks very much. Turn, turn the volume down. Uh, I'd like to just highlight a couple of methodological issues. Uh, clearly, the time each person took to do their transect could uh, influence the rate of recording. And also um, that uh, we were looking specifically 25 meters either side of a particular track, obviously. And you could argue that that could be increased and maybe we miss things because of that. So people need to bear in mind the limitations of, of what the numbers of people, there were only six of us, I think you've forgotten exactly how many, Jeff, uh, who were actually doing it. Uh, so uh, we hope this year that that'll increase. Thank you, thanks Kennedy. Um, if we go back, do, do please put your hand up if anybody else would like to contribute. Um, somebody had their hand up, but I think we've answered that in the chat now. Um, David, there was there were some other questions about, was it about habitat or about, about numbers of particular species, I think, that people are interested in? David, are you... Sorry. Yes, so there was there was a question about whether you're also able to record the records of the non-nesting birds and get a, a sense of stuff that isn't in your in your breeding list. Um, so if we could 
address that. Now, I'll also point out to you, Maria, there was someone who I think was called Pete Mantle was waving a non-blue hand at the screen, so maybe looking to come in after this. Yeah, no, that's fine. Let's, let's give Pete the question you just raised and anything else he wants to say. He, he will be the expert in that area for Mark. Excellent. Uh, my, my, my computer cut out, so can you give me that question again, Jeff? Basically, it was, did we look at non-nesting birds? And I thought you'd be the person to say, you know, the balance between non-nesters and nesters on the heap. Yeah, we, we did. Um, we were, obviously, it's a, it's a nesting survey, so um, we did look at uh, birds that weren't, weren't actually nesting. Um, and for some, it's, it's more obvious than others what, what's nesting, as, as Jeff's uh, alluded to already. Um, some it's pretty obvious, um, woodpeckers particularly. Um, but uh, we did look at other, other bird species. Um, and I think, we're, I think we were on the right track um, in that we, we kept, we, we tried to hone it down to birds that were just nesting, um, keeping territories, either singing or drumming if they're woodpeckers. Um, birds that we knew would be there from one week to the next. Uh, those are the ones we concentrated on. I think that's, uh, that was important to say. Um, and I think that should be followed in future as well. We're, we're, we're sort of keeping on that track of just um, concentrating on the, the birds that are definitely breeding, not the ones that might be breeding or possibly breeding nearby. It was, it was fairly narrow band, I would say which was a good thing. Um, I'd like to point out that um, one of the birds that um, Jeff talked about, the reed warbler, um, which for those of you that don't know reed warblers, <laughs> not surprisingly, they nest in reeds, um, but reed is one habitat that's been uh, planted or replanted uh, on the heath, on the margins of the ponds, um, specifically for certain birds, including reed warblers. But in the future, we might get other uh, new birds to the heath nesting there. Uh, one that um, I've recorded personally once there, which is a Chetty's warbler, um, may in the future turn up and may, may breed. So there are uh, knock-on effects four, five, ten years down the line where birds that aren't even there now might be nesting in the future if we get the habitats, um, get enough different types of habitats and they're in good enough condition. I Thank wonder you. if Liz, do you want to add to that? I see that Liz is, um... Um, yeah, thanks. Um, well, what I was going to say was that uh, there are lots of other birds that go through over the heath at the moment where we're still seeing migrating birds going over and there are some flocks of red pole there right now um, which people are picking up and recording um, so and then there's also the frustration that we didn't really see any <clears throat> green woodpecker nests so we couldn't record those but we know that the green woodpeckers are there and I had anecdotal evidence from another bird watcher that I was chatting to um, who'd seen a fledgling green woodpecker fledgling being fed by its parent on the grass and um, then being taken by a sparrowhawk. So um, they were nested, but we didn't record that because we hadn't actually seen it ourselves. Um, and then there are also other birds like the tree creepers um, where we found several tree creeper nests. Um, so that's very exciting. So some of these little tiny birds are definitely nesting there. We saw evidence of um, a gold crest, uh, a cat, taking food for young and also um, taking, uh, gathering nesting material, but we never found a goldcrest nest. But we weren't really trying to look for nests. We weren't doing it so systematically uh, and not wanting to go in and see how many eggs and all that sort of thing as well. And I don't think we're going to start trying to go in that direction for, for this type of survey. But if any of the people who have been involved in this sort of thing elsewhere, any of the London Bird Club group or anybody like that who wants to say something about this and give us any pointers, then um, maybe the thing is get in touch with Jeff. Uh, Jeff, if you put your email in the chat, 
um, then uh, that might be a really good a good way to do it because we would love to get find out you know if we're making any really um, bad mistakes or there are other things that we could do to improve it so that would be good thanks Thanks, Liz. And I, yeah, I think that's, it's always good to can kind of compare. I mean, there obviously are a number of different s people surveying nesting birds in various kind of, on various kinds of sites. So certainly kind of making a comparison and, you know, just pointers really. I mean, there's obviously was, been a lot of work done at Book and Common surveying. Um, I think they did a nesting bird survey there. I know they've done a lot of bird surveying. I, I don't know if you've had a look. I mean, obviously some of those um, studies are quite old now, but it's it may be that, that, that that's kind of worth looking at. But yes, please anybody else who's kind of got some guidance that they could offer or some comments that will be, you know, most welcome. I think we've got time here. We've got time for a few more questions. I've seen there's something about um, urban foxes. David, do you want to pick that one up next? Yeah, so so J Jenny asked, um, has the increase in the urban fox affected any of the species, do you know? No. Um, interestingly, we've been doing a... Um, Another bit of research, maybe another talk, is we've been running, um, uh, looking at the uh, effect of humans and dogs on wildlife, including foxes and birds on the heath, using a camera trap system that was set up for hedgehog monitoring. And uh, foxes are by far the most abundant mammal in the heath outside of squirrels, and they're everywhere. Uh, we didn't see any negative associations between areas used by foxes and areas used by woodland birds that were picked up in camera traps. Um, I'm not sure what foxes would, would eat. I think bird survival in the heath, a lot of the anecdotal evidence, the kind that Liz has been talking about, suggests that, you know, the big problems for birds as the heath are um, magpies, crows, and squirrels. <laughs> I mean, we've got, they, they, they are all big nest raiders. Um, and, uh, and so that, that and, and unfortunately, you know, crows are fed on the heath extensively. Magpies follow people around, and squirrels are are uh, are everywhere. So, so um, that's a bit of a bit of an issue. But that's all. Nothing in foxes specifically. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to go over to Linda. I think he's also doing real life waving rather than a blue hand. So, so Linda, can we pick up uh, your question next? Um, you... Yes, I just wanted to ask Pete when you were talking about creating like new reed habitats for birds. So um, we have those on the Heath Extension actually, quite a lot of reed habitats, but those ponds are fenced off. And that's yes. the reason why those birds on the extension ponds can survive except for the top pond. So what about the main Heath? If you're creating lots of habitats, but they're not protected, isn't um, won't you want them French stuff? I mean, how would that work? Well, this, is a, this, is, um, this is an issue, um, which obviously will be, have, will have to be talked about uh, very widely, um, you know, much wider than um, the whole group here tonight. But um, it, it has already come up uh, in our survey that uh, we think certain birds um, would certainly do better numbers wise um, if certain areas were fenced off now that's a that's a you know obviously there's lots of um, legal stuff in there and social stuff that needs to be okayed and boxes ticked and all the rest of it but um, it is something to to be thought about for sure um, with with a wide range of birds as well small birds and like like reed warblers and possibly in the future chetty's warblers um, but also other birds that, that uh, really crave a bit of quietitude like uh, kingfishers um, and little grebes and there's a whole load of them. Um, obviously for the water birds you can't fence off whole areas of water or, or ponds but if something's nesting in a, a clump of reeds or a, a particular hedge in theory yes you can do that but it's, it's the practice um, that's the complicated bit. And it is, it is particularly difficult in a, in a kind of such a heavily used site, which is seen as an kind of important um, area of recreation for such huge numbers of people. Yeah. It's obviously, it's a, it's a difficult thing to manage, isn't it? 
In fact, it's illegal to put a fence on Hampstead Heath, according to the 1871 Hampstead Heath Act. The only fences that are allowed on Hampstead Heath are ones that were there in 1871. <laughs> so, unfortunately, uh, no, that's not quite true. And Adrian will correct me that, you know, temporary fencing for particular areas, and you see that sometimes around veteran trees or where there, there's been a lot of erosion is possible, but it's always something that can only, that can be done very cautiously and only for a while before the complaints start pouring in. But I just want to mention, I, I really like Roger Payne's comment in, in the chats about, yeah, we doubt about habitats, uh, for instance, with white throats being restricted to scrub and could we look at where white throats could be? And indeed, you know, that's a real opportunity. And white throats are a nice example because there are a lot of habitats which ought to support white throats, which don't. Um, on the heath, I think. And uh, so we could say, well, what's the potential? Uh, given the habitat, given the bird, how could we how could we encourage more? That sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, there, there certainly does look like there must be at least some potential. So, you know, where, where you've got, you know, certainly <laughs> particular species, maybe where something, I mean, obviously there's the kind of development, the reed beds, but I mean, other, other kinds of aspects of the habitat as well. We're gonna just maybe have time for one more question, David. Is there one last thing you'd like to pick up from the chat? Um, yeah, so there's a question uh, from Sue Weber about what, what we should, whether we should consider anything about public communication about the effects of feeding COVID and squirrels. Interesting point. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have much to say on that. I've, I've met the people who feed corvids and squirrels and they love it. And, you know, you can't really deny people an interaction with nature. Um, I also, the other thing I'm really quite aware of, and this is something the RSPB is quite keen on, is, is winter feeding and all year feeding for a lot of small birds. And, and the bird bridge in Hampstead Heath, which is always covered with bird seed and birds and rats, um, is, uh, is a particularly great place to see most species of birds. So I think feeding is sort of a complicated issue. I bet there are birds we'd like to feed on the Heath and birds we'd like to feed less, but, but I think it's a bit too much of a, of a emotive issue to, to, to do. Um, I'll pass on to anybody else who wants to address that point from our gang. It, it seems know. to me that it's something which is, um, it's obvious to us because we're ecologists, but it's not so obvious to the general public. And that's right. And I think when it is coming from, a, you know, as kind of Jeff is saying, a sort of interest in connecting with nature and, give, you know, kind of feeding and looking after something, that's it's a really difficult thing to kind of unpick that, unpick that because the kind of spirit underneath it is a it's very generous one. And, and some of you will just want to foster. So it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a clearly, it's a very complex um, site to think about in terms of management and particularly because of the high level of use but it's you know I, I think we've really enjoyed learning more about the survey and seeing how that connects with thinking about ways of managing the site it's been really great to have different people who have been involved in the survey also kind of contributing their thoughts as well so I think that's that's made it a particularly interesting session I know we didn't get through all the questions in the chat so you have got Jeff's contact details so I'm sure you know are you happy with that Jeff? if people want to get in touch with questions you didn't manage to get through and also any kind of feedback about anybody who's involved with surveys elsewhere any kind of comments on the methodology any anything we are genuinely interested in any kind of contributions that people can make um, what we've got to, we have got to wrap up now I'm afraid because it, it would be kind of nice to carry on but I think we need to draw things to a close thank you again for a really great talk Jeff and for the other people who participated and good luck with your work and we look forward to finding out more about this survey over the kind of